Okay, so I'm going to talk about the, the new kind of new approach to design, especially in the Netherlands, which is called open design. And um, it is a bit of a hype, and I will try to also approach it a little bit critically and also to, to see what kind of questions it raises. And I will uh, particularly talk within the context of um, implementing this idea of open design within arts and design education, because um, my own background is, um, I'm an art historian trained, but I work a lot for media and media design as well. And currently I am active as uh, uh, at this beautiful school in Rotterdam, the Willem de Kooning Academy, uh, as a senior lecturer, and also as a, a researcher. And I'm doing my PhD currently on participatory strategies in open design at the Technical University in Delft. So that, that's briefly about me. And um, I'm also working at CrossLab, which is the new media department of our academy. And we, since, since I think since two years or so, we've been busy with exploring what the whole idea of open design means to, uh, could mean for art education. Because um, this morning there were several presentations about Fab Labs. Alex did one about Amsterdam and Thomas did one about Barcelona. And the aspect of open design is very closely connected, of course, to, um, to, to digital fabrication and, and, and sharing knowledge and so on. Uh, but mainly, mostly, um, this discussion is, um, is discussed from an angle of engineering and fabrication and not so much from the angle of, from, from the perspective of aesthetics, of design aesthetics. And for us, as an art school, it's very important to also, of course, take that into consideration. What happens if you, as a designer, uh, work in a context of design that is <coughs> participatory or even open? What will happen to your own signature and how can you express yourself as a designer? And I'm, I'm, we started uh, to organize a minor, uh, a minor program within our BA education I think half a year ago, in, in collaboration with the uh, Waag Society in Amsterdam, which is, of course, an expert foundation uh, in digital culture and, and art and design, and also with the Creative Commons of the Netherlands, and we will launch it next year in, in our curriculum. Um, yeah, open design. Um, of course, we, we know all about the so-called digital revolution that, that's taking place, the, the shift from, from 2D screen um, um, screen uh, sharing of knowledge uh, th screen, through screen and also sharing knowledge about digital fabrication and the fact that we have now so many fab labs around the world. Uh, how many are there, Alex? 150 or so? It's about 150. Yeah. yeah. It means that, that there's like an emerging al alternative economy of different kinds of um, uh, uh, production uh, facilities where people can share their work and also this sharing means, of course, that you have that your profession as, an, as a designer will, will change in the future. How, we don't know yet, and uh, we will see. So the whole, um, not the reason, but, but the context in which we're doing this is this beautiful book, Open Design Now. I don't know if, if you, any of you have seen it, but it's now the second edition since last year, and um, it's completely sold out every time. And it was actually the first, well, the first time the, 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 the word open design was coined, at, at least in the Netherlands. It's a Dutch publication, of course, um, published by Waag Society, Premsla Foundation, a foundation for art and design, and um, uh, Creative Commons, eh? Creative Commons in the Netherlands. And um, yeah, it's really striking that so many um, projects that are in this book and also the whole discussion about the emergence of open design is happening in the Netherlands. Uh, I don't know if it's Dutch. I'm always scared of talking in these terms of national uh, movements. But recently, even in the design journal, there was an, an issue about uh, open design uh, called Dutch Open. So yeah, we don't know. Maybe it's Dutch. Maybe it's the Dutch tradition of openness, so-called openness. <laughs> we have to see. Um, the subtitle is interesting of this book, Why Design Cannot Remain Exclusive. It implies actually that design before has always been an, inclusive, uh, an, an, an um, exclusive field, uh, being for only like, like the high designers and, and artists maybe. So um, the book uh, is also completely online. This is an old, old um, update, but you can... By, Chris, by Christmas it will be 100% open. <laughs> yeah. 
and then it will be closed again. <laughs> then the website will close. So if you would like to see it and read it, it's www.opendesignnow.org. And it's, well, it's good that it's online because you can read everything. But to start with, uh, what is open design? What, what can we call open design? I, I always try to say that open design is like the, 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 the younger stepsister of open source because it doesn't really match completely the, the criteria of open source. Uh, but we uh, at the Willem de Kooning Academy, we approach it as a new um, approach, as a new method of design. Uh, how can you as a designer um, play a role when the whole process of design and the, and, and the product are open? Um, so open design involves um, um, user uh, um, intrusion, so to speak, in the whole process of, uh, of, of uh, design, in conception, in production, in a realization in the end. And the important thing is, of course, the fact that you, you as a designer have has to um, uh, implement the feedback uh, and, and you know communicate with with, with, with users. Um, and there is of course a whole discussion going on about okay we have open design but what should be open? Should the blueprint be open? Should the process be open? Should the whole product be open? Should we talk about open distribution systems? Or even, should everything be open and can we then only call it open design? So if you have an open blueprint, op you use open source har uh, hardened software and you, well, you open everything. Would that be the, the good um, definition of open design? So it is a debate at the moment in the Netherlands also and, and I think beyond. And well, there are no answers, but we're trying to, you know, to work with the kind of, um, well, not, su not such a strict definition of open design. Um, there are some definitions, um, one by Wikipedia, uh, where it's about publicly shared design information, thus knowledge sharing very much, and no money, so it's free. So sharing and free, that's one criterion. Um, the second one was, was coined by the Open Design Foundation in, in the year 2000. Of course, there wasn't any digital fa uh, fabrication or manufacturing yet. But it was still also about the opening, the opening of the design and um, also quite radical, I would say, for some designers that are really like author-oriented. One of the latest dis um, definitions of open design is this one, uh, which already like came into being in times of digital fabrication. Open access digital blueprints um, adapted to will to meet situated requirements. So it very much uh, refers to um, the specific needs um, of, of users. And that's actually the whole reason I think why open design could be an interesting approach to design is that it gives users the chance to, to adapt the, the, the product and the design themselves to their own will. So it's about basically it's about making the design meaningful for any user. And of course, if you do mass production, it's not possible. So here's an example of, of one, one of the first designers that worked with, with this whole approach of open design, uh, Ron Kadushin. Um, he's the first one who published his blueprint online and also put the whole, this is a typical open design uh, format, that put the whole process online. Um, yeah, as I said before, why why is open design now important? Why could it be? Uh, um, why how could it solve new solutions to old problems? Um, nowadays, it's very hard to fix your own car because it's a completely a closed system, and you need to, you need to be a programmer basically to to be able to to access uh, access the product. Um, it used to be less less. Um, uh, difficult here in the times when you can still demolish your own penthouse and put it together again, maybe. But okay, these these um, systems are now closed, anonymous, and it's not possible to access your your products anymore. So I think if you are using and not preaching open design, but I think if it's if you can open up your 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 design process and your products, maybe you could make it more relevant for users themselves. 
an approach to this b before this whole emergence of, of open open source hard software and open design, and there are of course other ways to make um, uh, systems and objects and products uh, ac accessible to people. One strategy is design hacking, of course. This is a very um, in the Netherlands, at least, well known example of um, um, a design hack, Platonic Sun, by Daniel Sakas, also from Delft. Uh, it's part of the hacking I IKEA, uh, well, the development more or less, where he used basically like the, the cheapest lamp from IKEA to as, as like material to make his own products. Another critical approach towards. Um, towards um, uh, closed systems and also an attempt to reappropriate your environment and products around you is this uh, work by an artist from Amsterdam, Jan Vorman, dispatch work, and he gave people Lego so they could like, where's our, no, it's not here. So they could more or less fix the city and the environment around them. And that's, of course, very explicitly a way of reappropriating um, your environment to your own needs and to your own aesthetics. Another example of um, opening existing systems and making new products that, that are well, more or less uh, relevant for users is uh, this uh, low-cost prosthetics um, project, which we, Alex and me, and, and also the people from a media art organization in Jakarta, Indonesia, set up, I think, what was it, three years ago or something? Two years, three years ago. Um, you talked about it already a little bit this morning. But maybe you can talk about it, how it's going now, a, a bit more in depth. Yeah, well, now we're investigating of the, well, we're trying to collaborate, which is not so easy, actually, because it's there in Jakarta, we are in Amsterdam, completely different culture and so on. But still, we are trying to use uh, explicitly local, uh, local material and investigating in that. And it's a huge challenge to make... Uh, prosthesis for about $50 or $100 if you want, but not more. While in the Western world it's about 3,700 euros. And um, what can I say? I mean, we are kind of halfway. We have prototypes, which I showed this morning. And uh, we are about to testing this in February. So maybe in, in the summer or one year later, maybe, we have a workable, a workable uh, uh, a lower knee, lower knee leg, but you know the thing is that you have also this accreditation, international accreditation. There's all kinds of rules and stuff, but you know we don't care because in Indonesia there is no such system like healthcare uh, that you got insurance and all that. So it doesn't matter if they're not internationally approved prosthesis. But what we want is that thousands of people can have their legs so they can walk around the, like we can. That's our first goal, and I think nobody will intervene in Chok Jakarta about uh, a low-cost knee prosthesis, which is not internationally approved. No, <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, yeah, and in the later stage, of course, the, the people that will use it will be more involved, because now in the beginning, it also it, it illustrates very well this product, that you cannot have the user involved in any stage of the project. Yeah, of but course, and since, since we are de developing this in the Fab Lab, so the people the actual prosthetic users, they can come and change the design themselves, so... Uh, because I, was, I was just going to ask that, is, uh, is, uh, can they make them themselves? They is could. that your aim? Your aim is to do them in such a way so they can form Not, a not necessarily, we, okay. we are far from that, actually. I would be already happy if we have something using local material which actually works, yeah. but having said this, it would be nice uh, encouraging, encouraging the people that you say, look, you can come here and uh, you can work on them, improve them yourself. And that's actually the bigger mindset that even in the Western world, if you are, have a prosthetic uh, leg and there is something wrong with it or it hurts you, you've got to see uh, an orthopedic that helps you. And we actually turn this around that we think, look, you have the, the prosthesis 24-7, so you are the specialist. You know exactly yeah. where it hurts and so on. And that would be the bigger mindset to achieve, that to encourage the people to say, well, look, if there is anything, come to <coughs> us and work on it. Improve it yourself. I think that would be the, the right thing to do. Yeah. But we have a long way. <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. 
very technical. Okay, b back to uh, back to the uh, the systems of open design. Of course, the knowledge sharing, also especially in this project, but also in general in open design, is very important. This is a project. Um, it's called the Unlimited Design Contest, and and designers could could submit their work uh, on the condition that they would publish their blueprints and their design steps online. Uh, but the funny thing is, a lot of uh, designers published it, uploaded their work, but nobody has made iterations out of it. So maybe open design is only a dream. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, fabrication, yeah, we talked about it. It's very important to, able to be able to share your work online, to make the same products uh, here as you can in, uh, for instance, China. I, I did a project with the Willem de Kooning Academy uh, as an exchange between our students and those in China. I will, I will show that later. But it's very important to have, of course, the same facilities to be able to share it online and to, to be able to change it from a distance, let's, uh, let's say. Um, yeah, open source hardware as an aspect of this whole inventory of, of the Fab Lab. I know the Ultimaker, uh, the 3D printer, is not officially part of the inventory. But anyway, um, because of its open source nature, um, uh, this architects in the Netherlands made this recently built this camera maker. It's it's a room maker literally, and and it's it, it's it's a three D printer that prints life size. And this is really like a big. This is real size. Just built in uh, in August. It was uh, it was open in Amsterdam. And the aim is to make uh, to be able to make structures and and like, like these columns for for houses. Um, but it's because they very upscaled the Ultimaker and 3D printer eventually. And I think now they want, they want to make a, a canal house, but anyway. Can we download the machine for that one? Not yet, I think. Because this, from the machine, not yet, I think. But I think that's eventually that, that's the aim, to make everything open source and to publish it. But it was quite, quite a job, of course, to adapt. Especially the nozzle was, was difficult, I heard. About uh, documentation, because we have seen, for instance, David this afternoon with uh, the Arduino platform, and that he said that he left his wiki open and everybody could just contribute and document. I see, uh, you know, you can document and document something. And I, for me, the, there's always this big question how can you make sure that the people document things in a way that we can actually understand it? It's not so easy. Maybe in the Arduino world it works because it's basically code what you want to share, which you know it works. But imagine if I would have to document how I built this house. You know, it's not so easy. Well, not so the we house, need the printer, <laughs> or the printer, <laughs> or the printer as well. Yeah. Uh, but also housing structures and so on. And, and I think it's almost, uh, or I, I experience it myself even uh, with the guitar and the prosthesis and everything. That making it, developing it is one thing. But documenting it is almost as much work as actually developing the whole thing. And my question is always like, how can we improve the whole documentation system that people can communicate what they do so that others can uh, uh, actually make it from that? And then on the other side, there is a big contradiction that I, uh, because we have a, a hell of a lot of documentation at the Fab Lab Amsterdam, but I always notice people don't want to read uh, documentation, they want to hear people telling them. And that's the kind of thing, I've, if you have ideas, please let me know. It's very difficult. How to document? You know that people, what is the thing, why do people always want to hear it from people instead of reading something which is a kind of step-by-step -step guide, which on the other hand, by instructables.com it works. It's a huge platform and people making all this stuff. But that, what I experience is always like mouth-to-mouth -mouth, uh, knowledge sharing in the first place. Yeah, that's more convenient. I go on. So this is also an, an, uh, like briefly uh, um, an overview of what's happening now um, with, with the, the whole world of uh, 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 personal fabrication. Of course, we, we came from a world from craft where you had several products made by, by a workshop. And then, of course, came came as uh, customization, where you have these anonymous uh, products, standardized, uh, closed systems, uh, and consumers that couldn't couldn't reach them. And of course, now we're there in time where we can 
we can uh, personalize and customize and make the products relevant to our own use. Of course, this whole model raises new questions for designers and also for their um, business models, for instance. Um, how can you make a living with open design? How to do that? And I think a lot of designers have already thought about that, but there is not really like one solution. And I think also it is about your own creative uh, spirit, how to make a, uh, a living out of it. This is a project. This is the site by uh, Joris van Tebergen. He's one of the experts in uh, Ultimaker uh, 3D printing in the Netherlands, and he has an online shop where he ha he found out some kind of system to um, to uh, sell his products, and it, it's one euro uh, one euro per minute printing. So if you order a vase or an object, and I did nice. once, <laughs> then it costed me. 63 euros and 61 cents. So it, that's exactly the time it took to, to produce. Well, that's an option, of course. But, but the funny thing is that now people are, are selling, designers are selling directly to, uh, to the audiences, to the users. And so, yeah, they can make their own um, deals. And it's also a thing I would like to, to explore when I'm doing the minor program at my art school next year. I mean, what kind of creative business models could there be? if there's open design and you don't have to deliver to retailers anymore. Other consequences, users design, new methods, of course, new methods to, um, to, to work with design. Is, one is the users as designers uh, method uh, by the Vaag Society, which uh, we're in our minor, we're going to collaborate very closely with them and, and we're going to develop also um, the course together. So this will be part of um, our program, uh, our method actually to approach open and participatory design. And you can see, well, it's not a Bible, of course, but in every aspect of the creation process, almost every aspect, the user input is, feedback is used and, you know, and uh, uh, implemented, more or less. Um, yeah, so this is all very well for designers that come from a technical or maybe in commercial or an engineering uh, background. But um, for, the stu for, the, for our students, for the people we educate at the, at the art school, it's, of course, it's a question. Eh? If, if you evolve the user more and more, then what becomes of your job as a designer, or even your signature or your, like, your authorship? When you can say, actually, that f the, the old paradigm from f form follows function <coughs> is now changing into one as form follows user. So how can authorship be expressed within this situation? Um, of course, this is not new development, and I think since since the internet uh, became more, let, let's say, a, a 2.0, these discussions have been been everywhere, also in the Netherlands. These are two pub publications by uh, Mickey Gertsen and Geert Lofink, uh, two uh, designers from the Netherlands, who also claimed in the begin ten, 10 years ago and recently that... Um, Everybody is a designer in the age of social media, which is, is of course, debatable. Um, and that's what we're doing <laughs> at our school. Is everybody a designer in times of open design? This goes back, of course, to the, the, the old, the old um, uh, uh, philosophies of, of Ronald Barth, for instance, in his, in his essay, Death of the Author, he talked about that. And if you replace now the birth of the reader with the birth of the user, then... Um, it's actually the same, the same, the same discussion. Um, yeah, so these are the questions we're trying to address in our new program. Uh, what would be your role as a designer in open design? And how, and f uh, especially what will you design for this part user participation and for users to be able to appropriate your, the work? Um, I will skip a little bit more. And one of the, um, um, the perspectives we would like to explore in this minor is uh, invitational design. How do you design the invitation as like a, a separate piece within the design process? How do you design this for, for a user? Uh, Umberto Eco talked about this already a little bit in uh, his famous work, uh, The Open Work in 62, where... Um, he also said, well, okay, if, if every work is open and, and, and interpretative, then the author should make uh, the invitation. The author should design the invitation. 
And um, below is one example of um, a very explicit example, maybe, of, of uh, droog design, also Dutch designers, of course very much author designers in the Dutch tradition. Uh, the Do-Hit chair, which sells for 5,000 euros, I think, and you get a piece of uh, material, and then you, um, and a hammer, and you can hammer your own chair with it, which is sort of like, well, it's a, a kind of invitation of, uh, to, to participate. It's quite explicit and quite, but... <laughs> Droog are also one of the, f well, they're, they're, of course, very famous as being author designers, um, but they have been trying last, last year to make um, uh, oops. Design for download. a new approach to design. Democratizing the economic system of design. Hang on. An online platform for design creators, brands, manufacturers and consumers. A new way to download, design, make and share digital design. Finally. I am able to reach design that was out of my budget. By downloading a digital design file, I have the plans on how to make it myself or locally by a certified manufacturer. What's really great is I can customise the design to my own needs and make my own design from the original file. I'm a designer brand, and now I can reach a worldwide audience by sharing simple and easy to download plans. I can upload my products to creating less stock and less transport. My designs are in safe hands. The site is curated and offers certified manufacturers when customers don't want to make the designs without help. As a manufacturer, I'm interested in more use of my services and facilities. I like to be challenged with new technologies, such as 3D printing and meeting new kinds of customers. More work means more revenue, which is good for my business and my growth. Everything is makeable. Anytime, anywhere, by anyone. This project allows people to design furniture by plotting the design using an online interface. This creates your own unique piece of furniture and digital plan to make it. When you have finished, you can pay for the file and download it. Then you can decide if you make it yourself or use a recommended manufacturer to make your personal design. We hope you like what you see. Now go and experience the designs for yourself. Thank you. Everything is makeable. Anytime, anywhere, by anyone. Well, this sounds, of course, sounds very uh, friendly um, to, to the users themselves. Although, I mean, if, if you go back to the debate, for what is open, openness in design? I think it's, it, this is more a matter of ma customization rather than openness. But also, if you consider the fact that, um, and that's, of course, not strange because the author designer background, um, that they're questioning the fact of, of, of uh, should we give the user so much, you know, access to a, to a product. Do we really want our world flooded with a stream of ugly objects? Maybe not. Um, I was, uh, how am I doing for time? Uh, well, well? Uh, uh, the, the, you, well, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> we are about <laughs> the time that we can be. Kay. So uh, another five more minutes. So, and also, uh, if there is any questions, we, of course, want to give you the possibility to do that. Uh, let's see how I can skip. Maybe I should skip by sh just showing some examples of, 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 of designers that in the Netherlands that are like now busy with, with like uh, exploring new forms of, of um, participatory authorship, so to speak. But where, let me see, no, no, this is a movie, I will not show it, also no, uh, okay, this is one example, the last example I will discuss, this is a uh, work by uh, a, a designer from the Design Academy Eindhoven, Jens Divik, and he made, um, he is a designer that really works with the open everything philosophy, so um, his chairs are adaptable, he uh, uses partly open uh, source uh, uh, software and plugins 
And he made this chair last, last year, the, the layer chair, which you can download and adapt, I think for free even, uh, as it should. Um, and there are now, so far, there's several iterations made with, for several contexts. Uh, this one's made in, in, in Jogja, in Indonesia. This one in Amsterdam, I think, in the Waag. But you. That that it's not only the case that he's sharing the cut sheet of the chair because it's a parametric chair, but you can download his grasshopper patch and then you can do whatever you want with it. And I think that is truly open. Yeah. And you can see that there are different iterations of the chair, and, and the good thing about it, I think, is that if everyone can, can, can adjust it to his or her own needs. For cello player, Barcelona chair, Iceland. I will conclude with this Norway. one. <laughs> Iceland chair. Norway chair. That, that's uh, sorry, impression. Norway, not Iceland. Uh, it looks very Nordic. Um, we have a lot of uh, people who, uh, who have been deciding for 24 hours and they're quite keen now because uh, the jury is waiting. But uh, I'm of course going to allow you to have one or two questions before we, we break off. Is there anybody would like to ask something? Yes. Thank you. Uh, really interesting talk. Yeah. Um, I was just interested in the issues of copyright yeah. in what you're talking about and, yeah. and uh, how do you, I mean, if you look into film and music and the idea of there being no such thing as a copy left, to coin Nina Paley's idea, yeah, um, yeah. can you maybe talk about some of the issues that you uh, foresee uh, might come up with well, potentially man manufacturers taking a design and then... yeah. The whole copyright Sorry. issue, yeah, we, we are now, because um, of course everybody, this is the first question that comes in mind also from my students, and we're collaborating now with Creative Commons in the Netherlands to see, you know, and they're, they're now busy creating a, a, a zero license, I think, so uh, a Creative Commons zero license, but uh, yeah, it's difficult, it is, so of course you can put your own license, but then still, I mean, you don't have complete access to your, so what, the question is, of course, why should you make open design? I always say, from well, because you can make design more relevant for your users. Um, but yeah, it hasn't been solved. Like the business side of the story and the, the, the copyright side of the story, they have not been solved yet. Mm. And I'm happy that Creative Commons is with us during the development of this minor program, because we can really discuss it and also make it a case with, with students and so on. But you know, also in the, in the music industry, it's very difficult yeah. because um, people don't want to buy CDs anymore. Why? Because a CD is like 15 euros. Why would you do that if you can have the whole file in the sound cloud and you get it there or you get it for 90 cents uh, on iTunes? But nobody is thinking about uh, that there is that this uh, MP3 version on the iTunes, which never ever has the quality of a, of a proper CD file, but it seems that nobody cares. And uh, I think, for me, it's pretty, uh, it's really a pain, actually. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the problem, that, that a manufacturer could come and then do all the design. And Not if you put a license on it, a Creative Commons license, non-commercial. <laughs> yeah, but there's issues with that. Yeah. Well. I mean, Nina Paley was just in a workshop for stuff, but the only, there is no such thing as true copy left. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, yeah but Creative yeah. Commons 3.0 are pretty much covered, and you have to uh, give me five cases where it didn't work. I don't know five. 